Um, I've been struggling with what to say. The, the th- when uh, Euclid asked me to speak, he asked me for a topic, and I, I, this was like two months ago. I'm not that <laughs> long term. In fact, yesterday, I was supposed to give a, a congregation speech, and I, I wrote the speech on Monday, but I wasn't convinced about the speech. So, Doug and Brandon and Euclid came to my office at 7 o'clock, and so I left air after newspaper review to meet them. And I still wasn't sure of the speech to give because this is vice chancellor, chairman, and, you know, I'll be walking behind the vice chancellor. I'm speaking for 20 minutes, so I have to nail it. So they finished talking. They shared everything, and on their way out, Brandon says, we have to pray. And then he says, so in the prayer, he says, God, I want you to help Bernard. I didn't even know if he's, um, his, his speech is not the way he's supposed to. I didn't even tell him about my speech. May, may you change the speech? And, I mean, he basically prayed for me. And something they shared in that 20 minutes we met was actually the subject of my speech. And I'm told it was a good speech. So let's give the glory to God. Put your hands together for the Lord. Now, so, look, I'm not a CEO, right? So this is a bit complicated. I mean, God has CEO. Everybody here is a CEO. I'm not a CEO. <laughs> I only recently became general manager. So I'm sitting in this very interesting place where I am, I have a, an earthly boss and a heavenly boss right? So I am balancing being a follower with being a leader. And it's a very interesting place to be in because I feel the greatest training to be a leader is learning how to follow. And so I'm in a very good place. And I'm sure there are a few of you here who are not yet CEOs. How many CEOs are here? Let me see the CEOs. Oh, only 12. Okay, how many almost CEOs? You are, you are, you are one step to CEO. Let me see your hand. That's like 15. How many people are like middle level cry? The CEO has to take trotter to come to your office. <laughs> Let me see your hand. That's like 50%. How many of you are like national service? You just started. You just started. A few of you. Great. Look, don't worry. The truth is, it's not the position you occupy. It's the impact you have. It's very important. So we are in a very position conscious society. And so, like, at City Now, they say I'm the GM. So, like, when I'm coming, hey, Charlie, GM. You know, they, they give you a lot of, because of the position. I said, look, since I came back from my MBA in 2009, my work hasn't changed. My, I, I have been doing the same things I do. I've been holding meetings, running the newsroom. It's only now they give me the title. Now, don't wait for the title to, to, to play the role. Are, are we together? Now, I have been doing GM things over five years. So the, the title is just a confirmment. And because the person who employed me is not my boss necessarily. And the one who's going to promote me is not my boss. Are we together so far? So you need to understand that you're, you have an, a heavenly master you account to. Are we together? So I'm not working because Samet is going to raise my salary. I've been working at CTFM since end of July 2004. I have never asked him to increase my salary once. He's always increased it before I've thought about it. Are we together? My first salary when I finished Legon May 31st, 2004 was 150 Ghana CDs. If you divide that by 5.4, which is the US dollar equivalent, that's $27.7777. Are we together so far? And when I qualified for that salary, after my first month, some men said, you look so committed, we're going to pay you 250 CDs. So I never took that 150. So my first salary, I had a 100 CD raise. It may not look big for you guys. It was very big. <laughs> you know, 250 cities, 2004, national service. I'm 23 years old. That was a lot of money. So if you do your work as if you are doing it unto the Lord, he will promote you in due season. Are we together? <laughs> now, I also need to say this before I go into my presentation. God is a planner. God doesn't waste anything. He's not going to bring these two men to Ghana to meet Patrick four years ago, come back here if he didn't have a plan. God is one of the few personalities who doesn't waste anything. For God doesn't waste anything. Before Jesus came, he had prepared 42 generations ahead of Jesus. If you read Matthew chapter 1, if you, I mean, a lot of you, when you take the Bible, Matthew chapter 1 is very weird, right? The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Just, they were just begotten. You know, they were just, I was like, aren't they, aren't they doing anything? They are begotten, begotten, begotten. You know, but in reading that recently, some, I, I noticed that God is such a meticulous planner that he prepared the vessels that will carry his son 42 generations in such a beautiful way. So from Abraham to David, there were 14 generations. From David to Zerubbabel and the carrying away into captivity, 14 generations. And from the carrying away to Jesus, 14 generations. This is how meticulous God was. 
And in that lineage, there were harlots, there were Moabites, there were killers, there were crazy guys. All those people, God had to prepare for Christ to come. What am I saying? This program would not happen if God didn't have a big plan to start big businesses. God doesn't want to make you a millionaire before he tells you what to do with your money. So he's preparing you now. Anytime God begins to put a hunger in you, it means he's preparing you to give you something. So when I'm there and I, I feel a hunger to pray over something, it means that God is going to feed me that thing. So God has seen where God is taking this continent and he needs to bring people to help prepare us to manage the wealth. You see, there is a level above faith. There's a level above faith. It's called management because it takes faith to get a thing. Because it says whatsoever things you believe, when you pray, believe that you receive those things and you will have them. But in this continent, we don't manage the things we receive. So now God is saying, I will prepare you before I give you the thing. That's why they are here. So God is going to raise great business moguls out of this meeting. And he wants to prepare you. Are we together? So it's not a wasted effort. He's, if he doesn't prepare you, because he says, don't cast your pearl before swine. Why would God give you a business that will transform lives in Africa if he doesn't show you the purpose for giving you that wealth? So you are being schooled in how to qualify for that expansion. So you need to ask God to help you. You need to sit through the program. Don't leave. After lunch, stay through. If they sell books, buy the books. Drink from what they have. I always say to people, people say, Bernard, I want you to be my mentor. And I said, well, I, I am just one person. But I've been mentored by people who I've never seen before. I read everything they write. I listen to everything they say. They are men of God in America. If they see me, I can quote their sermons from beginning to end. I don't need to be near them to draw from them. These guys will be here for only two or three days. You guys need to tap in. Make sure they go empty. Like the woman, the issue of blood. Don't let them go with all they came in. Remove everything. Receive it. Because they came to... And you see, if you don't receive what they brought, they can't get the next feeling. If they go back with what they carry, God can't, they have a bedding to empty it. Are we together? From here, they're going to Nigeria. When you get to Ghana, they get to it. You did the right thing. If you start from Africa and you don't start in Ghana, you won't do well. Ghana is a starting point. Are we together? So you, you came through the gate. Now you're free to go everywhere else. And, and I, have a, I have a theory for this. Everything Ghana did from the first sub-Saharan independence, when Ghana did red, gold, green, everybody went red, gold, green. If you look at West African flags, you're all red, gold, green. When Nkrumah went socialist, everybody went socialist. When he says, I'm not aligned, they all followed. So Ghana is the prophetic eye of Africa. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. So you certainly had God and it's not a wasted effort. Now you are free to go to Nigeria <laughs> and God is going to bless you. So what I'm going to talk about today, I, I changed the topic around a bit. So I'm going to talk about God as CEO, but I say um, maker, master, and monarch. I like to rhyme. I'm a journalist, right? Make him master and monarch. It simply means he's my father. He's the man I report to and he's my king. But I'm going to do it in a very interesting way. I'm going to share some of the, my, my biblical convictions about business. And then I'm rela I'll relate it to that, how I have lived my life as a, a journalist and a media person and how we've built CTFM. November is an interesting month. CTFM started on 5th November 2004. So last... Um, 11 days ago was our 15th anniversary. And on Friday morning, when Doug and the others came to my office, the exact time we were having the meeting, which was yesterday, a week before that, my CEO asked me to lead a prayer meeting for all staff. And myself and Pastor Maoli, Maoli prayed to thank God for the past 15 years. And then I led a prayer to ask God to establish city for the next 150. Are we together? Because we also need to start businesses that outlive us. The days of one-man businesses that collapse when the founder dies are over. God is also going to establish things in Africa that will outlive us. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I have, a, I have good news for you. There's no company in the world that is older than God. <laughs> There's no company in the world that is older than God. I'm told Jack Ma is in town. He has the, one of the biggest businesses in the world. It's called Alibaba. But how many of you know that Jack Ma's business cannot meet even half of what is in God? I mean, Jack Ma's business is working in the space God created. If you read the book of Hebrews, which is my first reading, I mean, it's a beautiful reading. I like the Amplified Classic Version. It says, in many separate revelations, each of which set forth a portion of the truth, and in different ways, God spoke of old to our forefathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us in the person of his son, 
whom he appointed heir and lawful owner of all things, and also by and through whom he created the worlds. This is the part I like. The riches of space and the ages of time. So no matter how big Google or Apple is, they are working within the space God created. So God is much bigger than your business, people. So don't let anybody's business intimidate you. I mean, there, when we started City, we were very small in number, very few. And there were pillars in society that vowed that we would never stand. But they were only operating in the space God gave them. So if you're a small business, you are only one employee. There's nobody you pay. Guys, no, the only permission you need to enter a space is God's mandate. Because he created the riches of space and the ages of time. So there's no business that can use age to intimidate you. We competed in 2007 in the Africa Radio Awards. We started in 2004. That was only three years of being a radio station. My show, by the grace of God, was voted the most interactive show in Africa. After three years of operation, we had competition from Kenya, Nigeria, and even bigger stations in Ghana. It, it doesn't matter that we were three years old because the guy who created the ages of time was on our side. He's a timeless God. So don't disqualify yourself because you are young. You go for bidding for a contract. They say, ah, how long have you been doing this? We're only six months old. It doesn't matter how old you are in the business. If the one who created the space for you is with you, there's nothing that can stop you. I hope I'm inspiring somebody today. He made, he produced, he built, operated, and arranged. So God is bigger than your business. He is also the owner. Huh? He is legitimate authority has one or two dimensions. You, you cannot have authority if you don't own something. <laughs> you, you must own and provide before you can have authority. Amen? So when I go home and my kids run to me and my wife hugs me, I'm also a provider in that house. That's what legitimizes my authority. It's not the length of my trousers. Amen? <laughs> so God is the owner because he made it. Now, if the owner of the universe, that's the prayer she prayed when she was in trouble. She says, God, you own the universe. So we are, we, are, we are walking with a God who owns everything. Are we together so far? So he, and in that reading as well, God is much bigger than your business. There are, there are two sins with work. Two sins we commit with work. One is the idolatry of work. And the other is the immorality of work. The idolatry of work is where we make our work everything. We, make, we convert our work into God. People work from morning 6 to 9 p.m. Hard work is great, but don't make a God out of your business. That's idolatry. It says don't make an image of anything. So for some people, they have no time for family, no time for God. They have only time for their business. That's the idolatry of work. Then the other opposite is the immorality of work. They don't want to do any work at all. They just want to earn as much money as they can. So they just want to sit home, gamble. They just want to pray for somebody to give them money. But Thessalonians says, if anybody does not work, let him not eat. So balance is in between the two. Don't make work your God, but don't also be unemployed. Hallelujah. Am I making sense so far? So God is bigger than our business. Now, your business can never be too big for God. Neither can it be too small. I was reading a book recently. It describes the immanence of God. A lot of times we think of God as very huge. But I'm so grateful that even though God was so big, he reduced himself into the seed of the woman. I mean, if I were God and I was coming on earth, I would come as a fully grown 33-year-old. Because Satan is very bad. <laughs> I wouldn't come as a spam. No, I wouldn't come as a... No. But God is so powerful. He reduced himself and fertilized an egg in a virgin. An untrusted lady. And still Satan couldn't stop him. So it, you, 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 there's no issue too small for him. That's what I'm saying. So don't just see God as this huge beast. God can be so small that he's even concerned about whether you've brushed your teeth or not. Simple things like a pain in a part of your body you can't describe. God is concerned about it. So your business is not too small to get God's attention. Are you together? A lot of times we talk about size. We talk about bigness and success. You don't need to be big to be better. It depends on God's calling for you. you God's calling can be for you to remain of a certain size, but you make global impact. Are we together? So you, you can never be too small for God as well. Because size is found in God. Hallelujah. And God pre-exists and will outlast every business. This is a very important introduction. Now let's move on. One other belief I have is that except the Lord build the house, and this is the, the scripture we used last Friday when we prayed, that this building that we are standing on, if God doesn't build it, we are wasting our time. 
The media business we are running, if God is not the originator or the starter, it's a waste of time. And I like Hebrews 3, 4. He says, for every house is built by some man, but the builder of all things is God. I love that. It means the builder of the builder is God. <laughs> so God uses men in this realm to build things. God won't come down and talk to us in person. We can't handle him. That's why he came as a man. The same way he brought Doug and Brandon and Esther. He is speaking to us through men. But it must be initiated by God. For except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Are we together so far? That means that if your business is not founded on him, he is the word. He is the truth. If, you're, if the foundation of your business, if, there be, if the foundation be destroyed, Psalm 11, what shall the righteous do? Guys, if God is not part of the institution, it is a wasted effort. Are we together? So I believe that the reason my business city is moving forward is because it was founded on a clear word in March of 2004 in prayer time. The Lord spoke to me about a radio station he was about to start because I, I bought a Bible in level 200 with my student's loan for 90 CDs and I wrote the top seven things I wanted God to do for me at the age of 22. And at the, this is 2003 and at the time, there was only Joy FM. So I wrote to, in the Bible that God, I want to work at the biggest commercial English station in Ghana, which is Joy FM. Now, God, I didn't know that God had a bigger plan because God was going to start a radio station that he was going to use me to be part of. I mean, look at it. So, and when I look, I was speaking at the, uh, what do you call it, Pensa last week. And I, I opened the seven things I wrote in my small Bible in 2003, which were so big. I used to fast and say, God, do it. Now, 10 years later, God did those things to a thousand degrees that when I look at those things, they were so small. One of my prayer points in that Bible was that I wanted to preach at power service, our Tuesday service, LPU. Because I didn't, no student got a chance to preach. And it was my lifetime hope that I would just preach before those 40 students. And I prayed about it. But he's able to do exceedingly more and abundantly than all you can ask or think. Are we together? Now, the reason you must document your size is when you are small. You remember that it's God who made you what you are. So if, if I had to pray to preach at power service, and yesterday I'm speaking at congregation. Think about the depth. If I knew that God was preparing for me to come and talk to you, maybe I would have been too complacent. So sometimes ignorance is good. Because sometimes when God shows you too much of what he wants to do, you become arrogant. So he reveals it in chapters. So that when you obey, you qualify for the next level. Are we together? So that's why sometimes when God doesn't tell you so much. Because if I knew that I will be standing to speak to you, mine, I would have said, hey, girl, you got to marry me, man. Because in 10 years, I'm going to be speaking at Ghana. It's God, I see your conference in front of people. And I'm going to be the best morning show host in the world. You got to follow me, man. So, it, 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 but God is so kind. God is so great. And in the story of my media life, he's, he's prepared me. Because when I, when I came to Legon, I was the, the first show I went on, it was a, a, a radio drama. And my friend Maximus asked me to come and act a radio drama. And he was like, no, we have a meeting. You have to be part of the students. I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to be a journalist. It's not part of my vision, not part of my plan. And God always gives me a second chance. So first he took me to Maximus. He took me to Radio Universe to read Radio Drama. But I didn't see the connection. Then my friend invited me to come for a debate on Friday show, hosted by DJ Black. So oh, there's a debate. You're going to argue between men and women, something, something. I go on the debate and I lose, okay? All the phone calls, only one phone call supports me. Right? Because we're arguing, the argument was funny argument. It says men and women who are more promiscuous in relationships. That was the argument, right? And I said the women were more promiscuous, right? And almost all the phone callers were against me. So I lost the debate. But in the losing of the debate, the station manager said, look, I like something about you. I like the way you speak. Do you want to be a journalist? I said, I've never thought about it. He said, look, if you're free tomorrow, you can come. We'll make you a broadcast journalist. This was Francis Ankara in 2000. I was only 19. God gave me a second chance to put me into media. Are we together so far? So God has a plan for everybody. And he's so kind that sometimes, even though you disobey him, he'll still give you a second chance. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for the God of a second chance. Amen. So the foundation has to be God. Whatever you do should not be on the basis of an itch. We are not running CTFM because we want to make money for ourselves. We are running CTFM because God has given us a mandate. At the time we came, there were 21 radio stations in the system. God wanted to raise the level of broadcasting. There was one big joy, doing very well. They needed competition. There was no proper focus on business news. God saw that vacuum and pushed us in. 
you have to start from something that is on God's heart. It's not about ambition. It's not about simply wanting to do business to be proud. I've met middle-aged men who up until age 60 are still trying to prove to their fathers that they are independent. So sometimes when they do something big and nobody commends them, they begin to cry because they, they were damaged in their teenage years because they, are, they were never good enough for their father. So some of them have built billion dollar companies, but they are still babies inside because the whole effort is to disprove their father. But that's not our story. We are not doing business because we want to disprove anybody. It's because we are following, it says we are not following carefully or cunningly devised fables, but we have a word of prophecy confirmed. This is Peter talking. So we are following a confirmed word. You must be convinced in your spirit about what you are doing, whether you are an architect, a teacher, a painter, a driver, you must have conviction that God has called me to do this. This is very important. When I send somebody to the newsroom to do something for me, sometimes when they go, they say, please give me the photocopy paper. They say, ah, I don't give you. They say, oh, Bernard sent me. They say, hey, Bernard, okay, get the paper. Which means that the authority of the messenger is determined by the strength of the person who sent him. So when they mention my name, it opens doors because I'm the GM. Now think about it. If I'm going into media just because I feel like disproving my father, when the test of time comes, my father's anger cannot support me. But when the one who called me backs me, he says, write the vision that he may run who reads it. It is for an appointed time. You see, he said, he said, I will stand upon my watch and set myself on the ramparts and I will stand to see what he will say to me. Habakkuk 2. And what answer I will give when I'm reproved. Which means that when you are in trouble, it is the quality of the messenger, the message that backs you as a messenger. So guys, establish the right foundation for whatever you are doing. It shouldn't be for personal ambition. It shouldn't be to disprove anybody. It shouldn't be for the spirit of competition. It should be because you have a clear message from God and you are carrying a mandate. So I see our media job as a mandate. It's not just a job, it's a mandate. So when we face politicians, we face them squarely. We are not afraid because they are like, oh, you people, you, you are trying to be pro-NDC, pro-MPP. We've done this for 15 years. They've called us all kinds of names. We are still here. Governments have come and gone. We are still in the middle path because we have a mandate. So if you don't, if you are not clear about your mandate, when the test comes, you will fall. As he said, look at the recession. There were years where he had recession, but he still stood. Why? Because the messenger was with him. The message was with him. Are we together? The one who sends you is the one who will back you. So before you start, make sure you have the right foundation. This is what I'm trying to say. Let me move. I'm wasting time on this. Good. Now, God is a builder. God uses human agents, but God is a builder. He said to Moses, see to it that you build the ark according to the pattern. That was shown in the mountain, which means God is particular about how things are built. God is very particular about how things are built. There are two things you do with soil. You either plant or build. Now, if you plant, it must go in first before it comes out. The part of the seed's life you don't see is the most important part. Because you see, when you put a seed in the ground, for the first few weeks, you will not see anything. But the seed is connecting itself to life. Now, the quality of that process determines how far the, the seed grows into a tree. So, the years of obscurity, don't rush to go on media. Don't rush to be on front pages. Value your time under the soil. That's the right foundation. Because if I was, when I started my breakfast show, for the first four or five years, I wasn't getting listeners. There were days I would be on air and my producer would be listening to other stations. Because what I was discussing, nobody was listening. I'm telling you. <laughs> Richard Mensah is still there. You can ask him. You know Richard Mensah. They will freeze that. You can ask him. There was a day Komla Duma was interviewing Kwame Japan on some huge scandal. Everybody at the station was listening to Joy FM and I was on radio talking. You know? But the truth is that God has to hide you first and prepare you because the kind of mistakes I was making, if I had all those listeners, I would have destroyed myself. So cherish your time under the soil. Right? Make those mistakes when you are small. Don't be in a hurry. Like a lot of people come to me and say, look, Bernard, I have a small business. I want to just go on the radio. And I'm like, are you sure? Do you have the right phone number? Are you sure you have your taxes in order? Because if you don't get those things right and you come on media, it will kill you. So the time of isolation and the time of obscurity is a precious time to build your connection to life. Are we together? Because the root of the tree is the tree's connection to life. A lot of people admire the fruit. People smell the flowers. But what determines the quality of the fruit is the connection of the root to life, which is the soil. So your years of being underneath the radar are crucial foundational times to decide whether if you're having problems, you go for a loan. 
And yes, that we advertise banks, but we I don't remember going for a bank loan in the 15 years we've run CTFM. God has always come through. He's always been in the boat. They are, their salaries are due and we don't know what to do. But some way, somehow, we say we cannot build a business because you see, the interest rates here are different from in your country. Interest rates are about 26%. Now, if I have a company of 56 people, young people, and I go for a bank loan, it will cripple the business if, I'm not, if I don't have the connection to get a lower interest rate. So we've always managed to pay. We built that tenacity when we were small, and now we have 200 people. We don't need to go. So even if the month is ending and we don't have money to pay, when we were only 50, we knew that God could come through for us. So cherish those moments when you are under the radar. Are we together? No God-initiated project will ever be in vain. Once God has started it, God will build it. Hallelujah. The third foundation. God formed man out of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils and man became a living soul. Then God planted a garden eastward in Eden and he put the man whom he formed. God is a beautiful God. He made places before he made people. That means there's a place reserved for you. He didn't create Adam and say, what am I going to do with this guy? He already prepared prepared a place. So he said, when he formed Adam, he placed him in the garden he has planted for him. That means that no matter how crowded the industry is, there's a place for you. That's a prayer we used to say, God, you have given us a place in media. Now we have 358 radio stations, but you've given us a place. The fact that there are 400 radio stations doesn't mean there's no place for me. So just like you gave Adam a place, you placed him in the garden. Lord, place me in this ministry. Maybe you are training musicians. Maybe you are into music or whatever. God is the one who creates space for you. So you need one of the prayers you pray for yourself and your that God, create a space for me. I like Psalm 66. He says, we went through the water, we went through the fire, but the Lord brought us into a large space. When God creates a space for you, no matter how small it is, it will be large enough for you. Hallelujah. Now, there are principles here. The next verse says, The Lord took the man and put him in the garden to tend and to keep it. Now, and then the Lord commanded him. I like what God did. He didn't just put him in the garden to have a floric. He says, tend and keep the garden. What does he mean? You must, to tend means to dress, to enhance it. Amen? Tend it. So, look after it, raise its level. Then keep it. So, there are two dimensions there. When God puts something into your hand, he expects you to improve it. That's leadership, vision, forward, forward looking. Then keep it, maintain it, sustain it. Don't, don't mismanage it. Are we together so far? So the leadership is forward looking. Management is backwards looking. Leadership is about people. Management is about things. These are all principles in the Bible. So he said to Adam, tend and keep. CEOs in this room must always vacillate between the two. Where sometimes we are visionary, we are planning what to do, we are looking at the future, we are getting to new markets, creating new websites, entering related businesses. But other times we must subject ourselves to the process of keeping the bottom line okay, making sure we are not wasting resources, making sure the photocopy machine is off, making sure we are not wasting power. You must, if you, if you don't learn how to oscillate between future and now, between people and things, between leading and managing, you can never be a successful person. Hallelujah. So that's the principle in there. He put the man in the garden and said, tend and keep it. But look at it. In the first creation, God made man on the sixth day. He made places before he made the person, right? And on the seventh day, he went to rest. But in the new man, he's forming in the new creation. Jesus says, my father works till now and I work. So from the time of Jesus Christ, God is building a new man. That's why I said the first Adam was a living soul, but the last Adam is a life-giving spirit. So now God is more interested in making the man. That's why he says, I'll go and prepare a place for you. So look at it. Jesus Christ is the dividing line in history. Before Jesus Christ came, God made places and then he made a man and put the man in there. But since Jesus Christ came, God is creating a new man. And when that man is ready, he will prepare him for the place he's going. What does it mean? Our priority now is to build the man before the business. That's what it means. Since Jesus Christ came, God is now interested in building you. So in the new creation, look at it. He said, God will build the man. He says, till we all come to a perfect man in the image of God. So now he is building you first. So as he said, God's priority is people. 
Since Christ came, God is not as interested in the size of your business as he is as interested in the size of the person you are. He makes the man before he makes the prophet. Are we together? He fills the person before they fulfill their assignment. That's what I'm saying. He saves the person before he sends the person. He's not interested in you quickly going to start something. He's interested in you. He's interested in you. The scripture you read, I loved it. When you said you were a fisher person. Look at it. He met Peter, uh, Andrew, and his brother, and they were fishing. Then he says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, which means that it's not about the fish anymore. It's about men. I'm more interested in men than fish. Then he met uh, John and his brother, the sons of thunder, and they were mending their nets, and he said, follow me. So it's not about the tools of the trade. And look at it. He said, when he said, follow me, he didn't mention anybody's name, but their father, the sons of Zebedee, the Bible said, the two boys left their father and they follow Jesus. And I always say to people, sometimes we think that youthfulness is about age. It's about how invested you are in the system. Because these two boys were not invested in the business. So when Jesus said, follow me, they left everything and followed him. So Jesus must make you first. He says, if you follow me, to become a fisher of men is not a one-day experience. He says, if you follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. That's a process. So to become a, a, a person that God will use to do something, you must spend time with him. Are we together? So the focus of my, my message is, I focus on what God does with me first. As a person, what he does in me, before what he does with me. Let me repeat that. What God does in me is more important than what he does with me. Hello? He fills me before he sends me out. He prepares me before he uses me. He saves me before he sends me. So our focus is to build the man, build the woman, build the heart. Now let me shock you with some very interesting thing here. Listen to this. God cannot be the CEO of your business if he is not the king of your heart. That's what I'm trying to say. That's, that's the message right there. God cannot, he's not even interested. He's not interested in your tithe. Now these days we preach and people can go and do all kinds of crazy businesses and come and sit in church. And when they come, we change the message because the tithe will drop. When the tithe drops and it goes, you can preach a normal message. Those days are over. Where people bring money from wrong sources and because of the contribution to church, the pastor cannot preach the right message. Those days are over because God is not looking for your money. He says, for what can a man give in exchange for his soul? All the money in the world cannot buy a person's soul. So we need to change this doctrine where because we need to build a church building, we are now advertising the church to attract all kinds of people to bring money which is ill-gotten wealth i mean the politicians are in our church you can't speak the truth to them we come on radio and say oh ghana is getting divided politicians go to church pastors can't tell them the truth because when he drops the tithe it shifts the offering bowl the offering bowl it has to shift but we, we we need men and women in pastors who can speak truth to power and say we don't need your money you can perish with your money you cannot buy the things of god with your money this is what God is talking about. So we are not interested in just giving our business to God. Where we are, And this program is not about another success school for, for creating the next $1 million. No. If God is not king of your heart, he's not interested in your money. So let's not even mess around with that at all. Are we, are we together so far? And let's tell the guys in our churches who are bringing ill-gotten wealth, if you don't repent now, you're going down. And let's not coddle them and give them nice messages because we want money from them. Hallelujah. Personal development before business development. Personal development before business development. When we bring a manager into our company, we give him a few months to develop the person. We give them books to read. We try to imbibe them into the culture of the station. We have a new guy for business development. Because culture will eat your strategy for breakfast. So if somebody comes with a new culture and you have a nice strategy and the person is not aligned inside, we, it's not about how much bottom line. We spend time and say, look, you are here. We'll give you three months. We're going to show you how we do meetings. We eat together in the kitchen. Here, the only, there's, we don't have seniority. I'm the general manager. I argue with guys about football. We are all the same. We give him three months to get into the culture of the place. Because if we don't develop him, he will misrepresent us in the marketplace. Are we together? So it's not about whether he was a superstar seller, where he came from. And therefore, we just unleash him in the market. He will do damage to the business if he doesn't know the culture. So guys, in hiring people, make sure you, you, you work on their inside first. Are we together? Work on their inside. We are a small company, but we are moving very fast. 
Because we are people who are aligned. We are aligned. Are we together? Personal direction before business direction. He spoke about that as well. He gives you his spirit so you can get the right spirit. Let me move on. I've spent a lot of time on this. So are we making sense so far? Is somebody aligning their heart to what God wants to do? Is somebody preparing himself for what God wants to do with them? Put your hands together for the Lord. Amen. Great. So I, these are the principles we've run by. Let me, let me, let me run through uh, the last one. The last one. And I, I think I made reference to this. Jesus walking by the sea saw two brothers. Simon called Peter under his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. Look at what Jesus was interested in. Not the sea, not the net, not the boat, the person. The person. Human beings are the crown of creation. Now, I say this to say that no matter what business you're in, oil drilling, politics, football, the purpose is to benefit people. To benefit people. To make them better people. People over profits. Guys, this is critical. People, because we are in an era, and this is a Western thing, where, think about it. If a company lays people off, I'm a business journalist, immediately their stock begins to appreciate. That cannot be from God. Where you have a company, they are on the stock market, and they decide to downsize. They call it operational efficiency. They suck 200 people. Immediately the market's response is to say, let's raise their value. Because now they are thinking of profit. That's not from God. Because the purpose of the business is people. He met James and his brother John. He was interested in the two or tech. He was interested in the people. A lot of businesses are sacrificing human lives for money and profit. Look at the banking crisis. Think about nine banks collapse. Nine banks collapsed in Ghana from August 2017 till now. 22 savings and loan companies and finance houses are gone. 347 microfinance companies gone. 53 fund managers gone. If you put those companies together from August 2017 to today, we've lost 473 businesses. Even if those businesses employed even 10 people. Those 10 people, they have wives and kids. They have husbands and kids. They have relatives who depend on them. We are not talking about the messengers, the people who cook for them, the cleaners, the security people who don't have work. We have, a lot of people are going down. Yet we are saying, we, and, and, and you see, this is what we do as media. We use numbers to justify. So the, the finance minister said, we have pumped 14 billion cities into the banking sector cleanup. We don't humanize the story. So it's just about numbers and figures. 14 billion? Do you know how many people are committing suicide? Somebody said, a guy who used to be a deputy MD of a bank is driving Uber in London. He's driving, he's driving Uber in London. He used to be the deputy MD of a bank in Ghana. He's opening doors for people to sit in cars. If that is not disgraceful. Yeah, we sit here and we say, we, we only use money. So for us, everything is about money. No, it can't be. It's about the person. So we, we should think about the human cost of what we do. Are we together so far? That's why you must spend time to build the right foundation. The reason we work hard is that we have 200 employees all over the country. We cannot waste their lives. Some of them have wives and kids. Some of them are, have, have kids who are nursery. If we mismanage the company, they are going home. So we need, to be, we need to be right with our taxes. Jesus says, I sanctify myself for them, not for myself. I don't need that money for anything. Why, why do I need money for? But it's because people depend on you. So if you, want, if you want God to bless your business, align yourself because you want to help people. You want to bless people. Look at how he, he, he did a three-day fast to fire one person. Three-day fast to fire a person? Three, guys, three-day fast? Some bosses in Ghana don't even have the honesty and courage to have an exit interview with you. When they fire you, they can't even sit before you and tell you why you're going home. They can't even be bold enough to give you the letter. They give the letter to some manager and then they check out of town. Yeah, he had a three-day fast to fire one person from his company. God doesn't discriminate. It says the same God is rich unto all. If you are righteous in your heart, he will bless you. Are we together? We need to get our priorities right as a people. People are using company money to fly first class. And there are people who can't pay school fees in their company. Some can't pay rent in the company. And you are flying business class to a conference to discuss nonsense. And then you go and give a title and want God to bless you. You are not serious. You are not. Look, look, at, the, look at the difference in pay. The, the, I was interviewing the SNIT MD. He says the, 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 some people take 300 CDs as pension. 300 Ghana CDs. Divide that by 5.4. Less than 
I don't know, forty-seven dollars to to do national health to to do what with? So if if we don't have that mindset, and I'm not saying go and become a rebel and go on strike. What I said to God is, God, I, I want to use media to change things. If you give me a place to stand, I will honor you. I will, you see, because the purpose of your ministry is to establish righteousness. And you can't establish righteousness in the marketplace if you are not righteous in your, your dealings with your staff. So why should I say to God, interview the finance minister and put him to the sword and then come and mismanage my employees? God is not blessed that. So if your heart is right, righteousness begins from the heart. He says, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. So righteousness is the heart issue. So they cannot, that's why I emphasize, look, we can give you 10 strategies for success. If your heart is wrong, you can't succeed. You get me? So we should spend time giving the right heart because that's the engine. Guard your heart with all issues. Proverbs 4.23. For out of it are the issues of life. We have positional leaders who have learned to win bonuses and win elections. They don't know how to lead. And it shall not be so in our generation. It shall not. That is why we have to stay and learn. That is why we have to ask God to prepare us. I've spent too much time on this. I need to move on. <laughs> I think I've made this point already. Now, God's priority is people, not profit. His focus is catching men, not fish. His interest is not the tools, but the people. Now, this is a very important point. You must follow him to be made. You must follow him. He says, go and make, he said it. He said, go and make disciples of all men, not Christians. There are two meanings for disciple. A disciple is a student. So which means you are ever learning, right? But not like Janis and Jambres, who is never coming to the knowledge of the truth. You are a disciple because you are a continual student. I approach life as a student. Number two, a disciplined follower. Disciplined follower. What is discipline? The, the, the appropriate use of time, energy, and resources. You cannot superimpose a development model on an indisciplined people. So, Christians must be disciplined. Look at what is happening in the church of Jesus Christ. And Tiesta, somebody can be in a church for three months and start their own church. Divide, like, there's no order. We are just not serious. God cannot, he can't bring revival like that. Look at what Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira. There was so much order that when they broke the order, they were killed. Yet we are praying for revival, yet we are so disorderly. We are to be disciples. That's the issue. So a, a Christian is a disciplined follower. People must see us and glorify God because our God is a God of order. Let the traffic light go off at Shiashi. Let the traffic light go off there and see how we behave. Yet we are praying. You see, if we don't change our heart, God cannot bless us. So the, the generation that is gone have and I'm saying there's a lot of humility. They've made some mistakes. But we are learning their bad examples. We shouldn't. I'm saying to you, under 40 people, you have to change your heart. If you don't, Ghana will not be blessed. We have people who studied masters in Ghana who are working in Subway, cleaning dishes in New York. It's not, it doesn't glorify God. Because we've messed up the country and everybody's running away. We have to restore hope. How do you restore that hope? Fix the man on the inside. 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 Look at it. Matthew chapter 6. Where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. That whole reading. You see, the whole of Matthew is about the kingdom. Matthew 5 and Matthew 6 is about the lifestyle of the kingdom. I always say to people, no true Christian running a business will ever fall foul of any law in any nation. No, it's not, not possible. The standard that Christ brought, I mean, think about it. He said, you have heard it was said that if you, <laughs> if you, uh, you, should not, you should not have fornicate or don't commit adultery. But I say to you, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you already committed adultery. And he said, if you even hate somebody without a cause, you are a murderer. Now, that is a higher standard. Now, for Christians to be breaking the law, not paying their taxes and suing each other, they don't know Christ. Because the standard of Christ is there. So if you follow, that's why I said, my boss, Samens, is not the one who determines my pay. Because I am answerable to somebody who created him. But I can't violate Samens and say I'm honoring God. God is not an author of confusion. So I can't say, well, I have to go to prayer meeting. I won't come to church. I won't come to meeting because I'm serving God. No. God made me a deputy authority to him. So if I don't, I have to pass through him to go to God. In that sense. 
Do you follow me? So the truth is that the lawlessness is what is destroying the country. And until we go back to the biblical foundations of business, our business cannot do well. When God does something, it lasts. Most businesses fail after the first person starts it because it was not really founded on anything proper. Hallelujah. I've run out of time. I started as a salesman. When I left, the, I was thinking about my career. The first job I did when I was in JSS, we were selling meat, myself and my brother Michael. And he was carrying the beef and I was holding the, the bell and walked the whole of Medina selling beef. That was my first job. So I was a sales, salesman from JSS, from class six of our JSS two. Because we had, my dad had, we had eight kids and my mom and dad were civil servants. There's no way we're going to cater for all of them. So when we left school, we had to sell. That was my first job. I was selling, and that's not child labor. That's just helping you to understand life. <laughs> so, a lot of people say, well, kids shouldn't work. Well, I mean, I can, if I have money, I will make sure no kid works. But for me, there's no corner of Medina I don't know. There was a day I was selling beef, and they were playing football at Roman Catholic Park. And I was, I put, we put the beef down and watching the football. And a football came to hit my stomach. And the people carried me and told me, Kofi yeah, my mom was so my mom was so angry. She she almost killed people in the park. But but that's kind of danger. But it also teaches you things. My parents were great people. They are still alive. Beautiful people. But that was the time. This was the 80s. We, everybody in the 80s was farming, right? Then my next job, when I finished secondary school, I sold science textbooks for an eight percent commission. Every time God must qualify you from the first before He gives you the second. So I sold science textbooks. Walked around secondary schools in Accra selling those books because there was a strike when i finished secondary school in 98 we had to wait for two years to go to university 99 i started teaching teaching maths and science if you can teach class four long division and they will understand it there's nothing you can't do in the world <laughs> if you can teach class four students long division and they understand it that was my struggling as a teacher teaching me patience when i was in university first year i was still teaching before I, I stumbled into broadcasting, which was God's plan for my life for now. Are we together? So that's how it's been in my life. It's always been, God never changes your room. He always takes you to a bigger room in the same house. His room, is, his, his mansion has many, many channels. If you obey and qualify from room one, he opens room two for you. Are we together? And I know there are some of you here, you are standing at the precipice of the next room. Just go through that door right? Things are hard now. Don't measure your experience by the size of the door. To the business master something. He said he's had a dream and he had two, two doors. One door was very big and one door was very small. And God said, go through the small door. He said he was like, ah, this door is bigger. He says, no, go through the small door. Because behind the big door was a big steel wall. And just in the small door was an open space. So don't judge God by the size of the door. So somebody comes to you, you have a small discussion, he wants to start a farm. He has only 5,000 cities. It's like, this is a small door. You want to follow somebody to UK to go and make 50,000 pounds because that's a big door. Big doors may have a big barrier behind. Small door may have an open channel. Let the Lord lead you. Let the Lord lead you, guys. Start small. It's very important. I started selling beef on my head. Yesterday, I was speaking at a congregation and my sister took a photo. On, we have a family page. So my big sister took a photo and says, Ben, they call me Aloski. Aloski on show. And then my brother in the US said, uh, is he the MC or is he the one speaking? <laughs> and I said, you think I'll be an MC the whole the rest of my life? You, you don't know that I can also speak at a congregation. And I gave glory to God, right? Because now, and I was like, wow, this is the vice chancellor. This is the, whatever, the council chairman. And I'm supposed to walk like this. And we are walking like some big man. It was just nice. I give the glory to God. So then I was a trainee broadcaster. Your years of training. A lot of people who want to start their companies, and I have to wrap up quickly. A lot of people want to start your companies. Learn under somebody. Learn under somebody. Don't just go and start your own company. Look at it. Jesus Christ, his assignment was to save the, the world. He had three years to do his assignment. From age 12 to age 30, he was a carpenter. We don't even understand apprenticeship. The savior of the world was working with his hands from age 12 for 18 years. Think about it. For 18 years, he was working with his hands, cutting wood. And for three years, he came to fulfill his final assignment. Yet, National, everybody wants internship with pay. Nobody wants to do cleaning. Nobody wants to do washing. Nobody wants to do any job. Everybody wants to be given CEO, personal assistant to do PowerPoint and drink coffee and fly first class. He that is faithful in least is also faithful in much. Luke 16, 11. 
And he that is unfaithful in least is also unfaithful in much. He said, if you have been unfaithful with unrighteous mammon, who will give you true riches? And if you have not been faithful with another man's, who will give you that which is your own? Right? <laughs> Am I making sense? So apprenticeship. For 15 years, we worked for the CTFM brand. Apprenticeship is critical because a lot of us here are trying to start things. And it's very difficult. In Ghana, if you go to register in our department, it says a lot about who we are. So proprietorships, 80%. Partnerships, less than 10%. Source of funding, loan, 90%. Equity, less than 10%. Everybody wants, they call it eco minfa. Everybody wants to eat. I mean, dog, if you look at the register, you see, sometimes when I see numbers, I translate that into mindsets, right? If a country has most businesses self owned, including somebody in a kiosk in front of his house, nobody wants to share. Equity, capital, there's money available. Just give me 10% of your business and take a million. They don't want it. They want to take a loan and pay back. That mindset is not developmental. We criticize Indians, Lebanese, and Jews. They know how to open up. You get me? God is blessing them. We have to change our behavior. We are too inkumenfa. I don't know the English word for that. <laughs> and we call it yerekaya doing. Me alone, I want to chop. One man no chop. When you, when you look at that, so we need to understand training, apprenticeship, then we need to understand sharing. So, Start a national service, show producer. I was producing the morning show if I started hosting it. Broadcast journalist, talk show host, operations manager, director of news, general manager. None of these things have changed me. None of these things have changed me, hopefully. And I don't need the position because before I became GM, I was doing GM things. You can ask some I wasn't, I wasn't, it's not the position. Now, I've, I've spoken to this already. It's, it's a lot of things, right? In media, I have to stay authentic. I've strove, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ, but I don't convert my radio show into a preaching program because it's my fruits that they look at, not just the words I speak, right? So when people see me and they see my diligence and my excellence, no politician can say they've given me money to do an interview. They can't plan their things with me. I'm not in it for money. So when they are planning, they can't involve me because I won't even play that role. That's my, that's my, my I don't say I'm a Christian and we don't support this and we are the Christians. I'm not religious. You know, so it's like in Ghana, when you stop setting waters, these people, they are sinful people, we are the Christians. No, Christianity is not about fighting militant fights. Bear fruit. Bear fruit. Right? Bear fruit. Ah, you, you play reggae on your show. Eh? You play reggae on your show. Okay. Don't like reggae. It's bad. You don't play reggae. Just go to church. He spoke of the seven mountains. Don't you refer a reggae playing breakfast show host to fears God? Ministry is not going to church. Ministry is establishing righteousness. That's ministry. He says, Cyrus, my servant, Psalm 45. God is not interested. Look at, look, look at even Daniel chapter 2. Look at Nebuchadnezzar. Right? When he was ranking that altar, Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. God is looking for people who establish righteousness. Not people who will be using Jesus' name to make money. And hijack us to believe them because that's not my anointed. No. What's the, what's the meaning of that? That's not my, for what? No. So, Look, two things. I always say, I'm already in ministry. People say, Bernard, you know the word. Go and preach. Go and become a pastor. I'm in ministry. I am in the media mountain. My job is to establish righteousness there. That's my job. Right? If you are in, I, I was watching Tyler Perry and I was in tears. He was talking at the Tuskegee University commencement. This is my testimony. This is, this is the way I see business. This is, this is how I see it should be done. I'm not perfect. I'm only 38 years old. I don't know much. But I'm saying to you that if your heart is right with God, you don't need men to give you space. People vow that we'll never succeed. Advertising agencies will never give us money. We are still here. Some of them have collapsed. Some people wrote articles about me that I'm not qualified to be a morning show host. I have no humor. I have no personality. I don't go to the clubs. I'm still here. It's not they who sent me. You need those experiences for you to win yourself out of emotional reaction. Every day you go on Facebook, what are they saying about me? Hey, hey, they say me, look at this. Hey, God, they are wicked, man. forgive them. No. No. You need some of those things to, to make you strong. So, praise doesn't do so much to me now because I've had a lot of criticism. Huh? So now, when people say, better, you are the best. I said, no, it's because of my time. 
Don't let that enter. Because see, if I took the criticism to heart, then I'll take the praise to heart. The glory goes to God. Thank you very much for your time.